Okay, so I'd like to start by just introducing our panel. Uh, I'll start by introducing Wells Brown. Wells Brown is the Director of Youth Programs at Rise and Sun Center for Opportunity, a premier workforce development organization headquartered in Oakland, California. In his role, he oversees the Climate Careers Program, an employment social, social enterprise working at the intersection of economic equity, climate resilience, youth, force work, youth workforce development, excuse me. Um, prior to joining Rise and Sun in 2012, well served as an environmental and natural resource management specialist with the United States Peace Corps. It was during this time that Wells found his passion for grassroots projects, community-centered models, and mission-driven work. While with the Peace Corps, work, Wells worked on a myriad of different initiatives ranging from health awareness, community education, sustainable agricultural practices. Wells is a deep advocate of equitable green of our future and advocates for the inclusion of and advocates for the inclusion of disconnected and underserved um, communities throughout the process. Nancy Kaplan is the Building Performance Institute Director of Workforce Development. Nancy has been with BPI since 2009 and has worked extensively in shifts with BPI, working collaboratively to move the home performance industry forward. Currently, she's focused on BPI building science principles and healthy housing principles, e-certificates of knowledge as a way of introducing individuals seeking careers in energy efficiency and existing building improvement to the concepts of home performance. House is a system in the impact of, li of, the, of our living environment on our health. Nancy also works to grow the awareness of careers within the home performance industry. And um, we'll just have Harrison provide a brief introduction to himself. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Harrison Grubbs. I'm Clear Result Vice President of our Energy Efficiency Practice. And, you know, as Clear Result is one of the largest employers in the United States and, and in Canada dedicated to energy efficiency, we're really committed to ensuring that we have the workforce in place to achieve all of our own company goals as well as the as the goals of all of our clients. So really appreciate the partnership we've had with BPI, with Rising Sun over the past several years, and look forward to uh, to working with them and, and other partners to help solve some of the issues that Nicole is going to lay out to us. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Harrison. And then finally, myself. Um, again, my name is Nicole Davis. I'm a senior practice consultant here at Clear Result. Um, where I lead the low and moderate income portfolio of programs. Uh, prior to this role, I worked as an engineer uh, with large, uh, large commercial and industrial customers, and I also worked as a policy design and evaluation consultant, providing uh, policy support for the Southeast. Um, so thank you again to all the panelists, and I'll jump into um, our agenda our agenda item on why workforce development. Uh, next slide, please. So why talk about workforce development? It's a very broad topic, but for our industry, people are the driving force. We are essentially a service industry supported by technology. And it feels like currently we're at a point where um, as we try to address our conservation goals, decarbonization goals, climate goals, uh, our success in meeting those goals are going to rely having the right people in the right places. Um, as a country also, we have some economic and social challenges factors that have shaken up how we, we've traditionally addressed our workforce needs. And I'll take a moment here to acknowledge that, you know, while we're here to talk about workforce development today and grow in our industry, there's definitely um, indications that we might be headed towards a recession. And while I'm not an economist, um, our history as a service-oriented industry may possibly shield us from you know, the full force of what a recession might cause. Um, so that, that, um, that's to set the stage of what we'll talk about today. And um, 
We'll talk with our panel panelists to get their perspective on workforce development and what it means for energy efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, the chart on the screen is a uh, is from LinkedIn's uh, Global Green Skills Report that was put out, I believe, earlier this year, or I'm sorry, last year. Um, and the LinkedIn's trends basically says that in four years, there will be a 2% gap between supply and demand for workers in the green workforce. As energy efficiency providers, um, we see and hear about the concerns for workforce development from our partners and our utility clients. And um, factors that are driving those concerns range from work for, workforce wage competitiveness with other sectors, um, reti a retiring workforce, and then there's skills gap, and, and just in general, a greater demand um, for, for more people as we, as we put a greater emphasis on sustainability and decarbonization. We also have uh, states like New York that are making uh, large investments. Um, I know I know that I've seen figures um, as the latest figures that I've seen coming out of New York has been about a hundred million in clean energy workforce development to help them address their 40 percent greenhouse gas reduction goals by 2030. And to give a sense of the scale of that opportunity, um, they have a carve out of training 14,000 workers across their heat pump supply chain alone. And that's that's just one supply chain. And then also from our utility partners, we've seen utilities such as Ameren, Illinois, who've created their market development initiative to support their EE programs that not only focus on saving energy, but also creating uh, economic opportunities and creating an increase in jobs with local and diverse businesses. And then as implementers, as clear result, we've been seeing more and more in requests for proposals, uh, utility asking us to address uh, workforce development. Uh, states like California have several initiatives to support workforce development requirement. And um, that's one of the reasons we have Wells Brown here to give a, a California specific uh, perspective uh, later on in our discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on this on this slide, um, this is the jobs in the energy efficiency sector. We can see that you know until 2020 there was an upward trajectory. However, in 2020 we lost um, about 270,000 jobs, or about 11.4 percent. We regained um, 57,000 jobs, or about 2.7 percent in 2021. But I guess the question is, can we get back to the pre-2020 growth rate? And with the, with the large decarbonization goals that, that we've seen, um, we'll, need to, we'll need to get more people into our workforce. So our discussion today will explore you know, whether we can compete with other industries in terms of wages and career advancement and what strategies we need to train the future uh, the future of workforce. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next trend that we'll we'll focus on are demographic trends. You know, as we talk about workforce development, we also need to consider um, equity and representation in our workforce. Our, our industry is still overwhelmingly male um, in comparison to uh, to the general workforce in the U.S. And to be more representative of the customers we serve, workforce development will need to consider equity and uh, provide an equal opportunities for all groups. And in addition to gender and race, we'll also need to consider uh, age. Our industry relies heavily on skill trades. Um, and as those people, those experienced people retire from our workforce, we'll need to facilitate um, knowledge transfer from more experienced workers to younger workers uh, entering the workforce. And then on the other side, we'll also need to consider how, um, how we can help 
uh, more experienced workers who um, who have training in some of the existing technologies that we work with today, how can we help them to transition to newer technologies and newer skills needed to address um, the new solutions of the future? Uh, next slide, please. So um, here we will will transition into the discussion phase of our of our webinar today and, and talk to the panel. And uh, before we jump in, I'll just ask. Uh, Nancy and Wells to to give us a, uh, an introduction to their organizations and how they each address uh, workforce development from an organizational perspective. Uh, so yeah, Wells Brown, Director of Youth Programs at Rising Sun Center for Opportunity. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, Rising Sun is, is a nonprofit organization working at the intersection of economic equity and climate resilience in the California Bay Area. and. and San Joaquin County. Um, we have offices in Oakland and Stockton, and, and out of those offices, we implement two separate workforce development programs, um, one of which is focusing on youth from low-income households, uh, and the other focusing on adult barriers to employment. Um, for the adult program, we provide training, case management, and a year's worth of wraparound services for participants who are looking to gain the necessary skills and certifications that will enable them to gain entry into the labor trades. Um, and specifically with the uh, positions in the labor trades that provide family sustaining wages, benefits, and clear pathways of upward mobility and progression. Uh, our youth program, uh, which is the over, uh, which is the program that I oversee, um, we provide our participants with um, on-the-job work experiences and trainings that allow these young folks to go out into the community to provide residential energy and water audits and the installation of no-cost energy and water efficient measures for homeowners and renters throughout the service territory. Um, through this program, besides conducting valuable in-home work and, and earning a paycheck, our, our participants are also being invested in through in-office and on-the-clock personal and professional development workshops that range in topics from resume and cover letter writing to financial literacy and capabilities, and environmental and social justice issues. Um, the intent of each of these programs is to build the workforce population of today and tomorrow and provide the skills and services required to help our participants gain meaningful employment uh, both now and in the future. Uh, thank you, Wells. And Nancy, can you also just provide an overview of your organization? Everyone, thank you for being here. I always feel like I should start with an explanation of how BPI came to be. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, BPI came out of a grassroots movement in weatherization back in 1993 uh, when people were really figuring out that any weatherization work that was being done needed to be done in a consistent manner and done to a certain set of standards that were established for everyone to ensure that the work was done correctly, efficiently, uh, in a way that wouldn't do any damage. Um, so the grassroots movement started. It was established also to create a professional certification because basically we are talking about building science. Many of the people working in our industry are it's in some way a scientist and they put together all of these standards which are created in an open transparent way using people from across the nation who have a lot of experience a lot of knowledge whether it's through the science or whether it's through boots on the ground actually having done the work so that's transitioned into us of course being a certifying body we offer the certifying exam or certification exams in order to show that the people who earn our certifications are qualified to do the work. Uh, the, my role in workforce development a lot of times has to do with connecting the dots for people. So if I know of a great program like the one Wells is doing, I can help someone who is just starting out trying to figure out how do they do the same thing in their community. And a lot of the workforce organizations that I deal with are looking to deal with the issues discussed earlier, you know, getting to the underserved population and making sure that the opportunities are open to anyone and everyone. So hopefully that answers that question. 
Yes, thank you so much, Nancy. And uh, Harrison, would you like to give the clear result perspective on uh, workforce development from an organizational perspective? Sure, sure, Nicole, happy to. And it kind of is going to echo a little bit of what you shared, you know, during your opening is, you know, we, we've been given really ambitious goals by many of our clients, whether it's energy reduction or um, or carbon reduction. And we know that the way that we're going to get there is it is critical to have a really skilled and really large national workforce that's familiar with all of the changing technology and the cutting technology that 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 come into the market now. And the sooner we can make that happen, the better it will be for all of us. So that's really our motivation is to make sure we can keep this industry moving forward with a workforce that's, help, that's going to help us get to where we need to be. Yeah, thank you. And um, Nancy, what would you say is the, the primary motivation for the people and organizations who work with BPI to, to gain certifications? I, I think first and foremost, there are programs that call out BPI certification. That's the initial. So if I were, were required to be certified in order to hold the job, that would be the initial driving force. But I'm also seeing a lot of growth in people becoming more and more interested in the industry uh, in terms of wanting to develop their own business, to have a private business and make this a successful career. Um, so that's that's where we, we are seeing a lot of our growth. Uh, same question for you, Wells. You know, what's the primary motivation for young people coming to Rise and Sun or organizations coming to Rise and Sun? Yeah, yeah. We run a dual program for, for youth, one for youth and one for adults. The motivation is is a bit different between those programs, but honestly, like for the young people or the adults, paychecks, stable work, and these are really big drivers. Our adult program. You know, it serves a large a large portion of previously incarcerated folks. So the ability to be employed is harder for them, as many industries and organizations won't hire them. Um, uh, but the, the the trades are are, are quite open to that, um, and so that's why we focus on that industry. And then for our youth program, there it is a big difference, uh, a bit of a difference. And but the paycheck is still a large driver there for sure. Um, but what really is drawing these folks, you know, their age is 15 to, to 22 years old. Um, you know, if you look at the statistics, they really sort of land between 16 and 19, about 80 to 85 percent of the time. Um, but we're, so what's really drawing them is that this is a program that's going to, um, you know, allow them to have a lot of responsibility, autonomy, gain different work exposures than their other, you know, youth uh, colleagues and friends might be doing um, and, and, and really get an opportunity that's going to allow them to build their resume. And I'm not going to hate on the food industry. I've said this a bunch of times. I started in the food industry, but it's going to allow them to build their resume in a much more real world applicable way as they transition from young person into adulthood with adult responsibilities and adult requirements at a household level. Yeah. Um, so do you think that there some of the youth participants are using uh, these programs as an alternative to college or even community schools, community colleges? Yes, absolutely. Some of them are. Um, some of them are in positions where they're trying to figure out what that next step in their life is as they transition out of school and, and continued education, whether it's two years or four years, is not calling them at the moment and it's not where they are identifying their path. So they're trying to have exposure into um, the world of work and, and reviewing this is a friendly opportunity for them to enter into a nurturing and, and skill building capacity where where they get to really sort of test the waters the additional aspect of our program is that post the summer the summertime when they're doing these energy efficiency work they are being placed into external organizations within the clean economy and they get exposure to a myriad of different roles within that clean economy are sometimes on sometimes are research based sometimes are community focused um, and so it just allows for additional exposure and they get to use us as a one-stop shop for multiple opportunities. Thank you. And um, G, in terms of the organizations that work with Rise and Sun and utilities, have you? Do you think that there's been a greater 
increase in interest in working with organizations like yourself recently? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the writing's on the wall that there's a workforce need, and 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 obviously there are folks that can internalize that and try to run their own workforce development programs with it. But when you see someone that's operating in that field through residential energy efficiency or labor skills, um, and they are within you know, your back door, you know, they're absolutely going to tap into you and be like, you know what, your guys are doing something here that can satisfy what we're looking for. And so, yeah, these these instead of energy. Um, benefits of programs that are being offered. They're seeing a dual, a dual between the energy uh, uh, benefits, you know, those resource benefits, and then the non-resource benefits, which are skill development, pipeline for employment opportunities, um, and job placement, and upskilling of hopefully the next generation of, of, of folks who are going to be doing this install work, this deep work, the work, um, uh, line work, whatever it may be. Thank you. So um, my next question is um, the job market that we're currently in, you know, coupled with the inflation is causing upward pressure on wages. And so, Nancy, this question is for you or or Harrison, you know, whoever would like to jump in here. Um, how do we as an industry attract more people to energy efficiency because we're competing with other trades? Um, uh, yeah. So how how can we attract more people? and also compete with with the trades, I guess. And Nancy, if you don't mind starting, then maybe Harrison. I think that this is such an opportune time for us. Um, first of all, uh, in addition to what Wells was saying, we have a generation of people coming up that realize they really want to make a difference. So in our industry, they feel that connection. They feel the impact of what they do is not just money. We all need money. We all have bills to pay, but it's not just money. If I've been able to help someone improve the quality of the, their life, whether it's doing insulation, whether it's connecting them to other services, I think that makes a huge impact. And I think some of the ways we have to reach out is we have to be in those communities that are underserved, that have those populations that don't or, or even just our youth who don't necessarily know where to go or where to turn. And I'm seeing some of the most successful programs be the one like Wells has, where you're coordinating community services and you're actually providing training within that community, whether you are coordinating things with faith-based groups, with community action groups. Um, I've even seen you know businesses and law enforcement come together to support for programs for the training, the apprenticeship. Um, in one case that I can think of with um, in Delaware, where the Delaware Help Initiative is being implemented from different cities, there's even a funeral home director that's involved and in supporting this. So, I mean, there are a lot of ways to go, but I think it's really, really important that we understand that we have to work together and we have to be in those communities and we have to be providing all around services that are going to enable people to be successful. Yeah, I, I mean, Nancy, I think I think you hit on some some really critical points. And I think what I see from our perspective, you know, as we as we look to hire folks and bring folks into the organization and into the industry, there, there's not a single answer, right? People come to this industry from many different perspectives. You know, Wells touched on folks who are looking for, you know, good paychecks, good career paths, good career progressions. Um, you know, Nancy talked about the mission-driven folks. So so each of those come to the industry with different perspectives. I think what's really interesting from our perspective is, you know, very rarely do we get, you know, folks who are fully out of, you know, Wells' certificate, Wells's programs with Nancy's certifications. You know, if we had more folks like that, they could literally hit the ground on day one. What we find a lot in our job market is that most employee most employees come with a subset of skills. So they're going to come to our organization with some good technical skills. But then we really need to bring them up, you know, to speed on, you know, the regulatory and the soft skills. Or likewise, they could come with zero technical skills, but be incredibly passionate and knowledgeable about the industry. But we really need to boost up on the technical skills. So I think it's really that cross. I think Nancy touched on it. It's really that working together and making sure that across all these different organizations, all these different um, 
entities were actually providing that comprehensive approach. You know, I'll, I'll share just one example. Um, I worked in the Massachusetts programs for many years and we had dedicated outreach. You know, this is kind of to Wells's earlier point, dedicated outreach to the local vocational schools to make sure that, you know, as folks were going through those programs, you know, they understood all of the options for them. You know, that that there are, you know, options to, you know, open your own business and become a sole proprietor or a small business owner. But there are also great opportunities to, to leverage those exact same skills working for this new world that being the utility programs that many of them just ha haven't been familiar with. So I think it is that cross sectional approach and making sure we get that fully trained, fully developed workforce that can have the biggest uh, the biggest overall impact. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'd like to switch um, my line of questioning to go back to one of the trends we talked about, you know, myself as a woman and a person of color, a black person, um, I've heard, you know, through my network that a lot of people who are like me don't know that this is a career path, that this isn't, or just not aware of this industry as a career path and as we think about equity and representation you know what can we do more of to make sure that our workforce is is representative as we try to build it as we try to develop it for the future and um, i'll give this question to, to wells to start if you'd like please yeah absolutely thank you um this is a super important uh question it's a, it's a really um really large issue that needs to be tackled in all of this. And, and, and I think it really boils down to that inclusivity stems from representation. If we can see ourselves role modeled in a position, we can envision ourselves doing that as well. Uh, it's, it's why representation is so important. Um, and we can ensure that the development of, of, of future workforce is inclusive through the targeting of outreach and, and hiring strategies, training programs, et cetera. Um, we can ensure that by, by targeting them at communities that have been historically left out or marginalized by, by, by industries or are currently un underrepresented right now. Um, you know, a strong example of this in the Climate Careers Program, which is the youth program, is that we have mandates that if we are going to open an office in a given city in, in one of our, our, our service territories, that, that the office that we open is representative of the community that we are aiming to serve. That's both in gender, ethnicity, race, and even, and even language capabilities so that we can offer those services and, and role model that and provide those services in non non English speaking households um, and, and help to bridge that that gap. Um, we also, you know, when talking about our, our adult program, you know, we are uh, we run a program called uh, Women Building the Bay, as, and it's our all-female pre-apprenticeship program that we offer, and, and we're the only program operating that uh, in the state of California and only a handful of the entire country, and all of it is with the intention of getting women into the trades. You know, the trades are family-sustaining wages, upward mobility, family benefits, et cetera, um, really helping them to 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 break you know intergenerational cycles of poverty or, or bring home um, family sustaining wages and support their households and and, and we do both of that program and on the opportunity build side and those recruiting mandates on the climate career side because we understand that representation matters and currently folks are being underrepresented and these this is a burgeoning industry with a lot of potential and we need to make sure that that it is equitable and that it is um, representative of of all facets of, of human life walking experiences thank you uh, nancy were you going to add something uh, I, I was thinking as as he was speaking, uh, I've seen some really good, and unfortunately I don't have it handy, but really good materials that explain diversity, equity, inclusion. The difference between the three, that they're not necessarily all lumped together, but the importance of each one. Um, my other thing is, I really feel like we have to get, and this is a far reaching goal, but get building science included in our science courses that we're teaching. So people know what that means. I came into this industry never having heard of building science, home performance, was kind of skeptical when you told me I needed to seal up my house and then ventilate it. It was like, huh, what does that mean? Um, understanding it now, it, it, you kind of 
do develop a passion for why these things are so important. And if we are passionate about it, I feel like we can share that passion. And that passion is also something that will that people will respond to and want to be part of. So getting into the areas where we can connect with people, starting young, making it part of everyday life, but but really reaching those targeted groups. Yeah, and I, and I'll echo. I think I think Wells had a critical point. You know, I, I've talked a, a lot today about you know how we have ambitious goals for our for our clients. You know, to deliver, and th we cannot do that successfully unless our staff who are out in the community look like, talk like, you know, feel like, think like the community they're serving. Because I think the work that we're doing. When you talk about going into businesses, going into homes, making changes, it's work that stems from from a core level of trust. And, and it takes a while to build that trust. And by leveraging the community members where you're working, it helps accelerate that process and it's going to help us accelerate um, you know, the transformation we're, we're looking for. And then, Nancy, you, you reminded me of um, early in my career, probably about 15 years ago, we um, did through a grant funded program, we offered BPI training to 50 unemployed minority women in Louisville, Kentucky. And this is 15 years ago, trying to train on blower doors and infrared cameras without any real market signals that there's a transformation coming, there were job opportunities. And I feel like as an industry, we've come a long way where there's at least more awareness, you know, than there was, uh, say, 15 years ago. But I still think there's a long way to go more broadly with making sure that not just from an employment perspective, but from just an awareness perspective, all of these diverse communities and di diverse demographics are aware of the type of work that we're doing. And then with that awareness, it's going to leverage the interest that could eventually result in employment. So it's not just looking for jobs, but it's really shifting the market and shifting the way people think about this work that will in, in, that will help drive the employment. Thanks. And, you know, I'll just provide my my own perspective here. Um, you know, one thing that I've seen internally in, in our organization, we have, you know, different employee re resource groups and within the groups that I'm a part of, we, although we're already in the energy efficiency industry, we still learn from each other because there, there often is similar types of people and similar types of roles. And so in these, you know, resource groups, when we talk to each other and talk about the work that we do, I, I think people's eyes are kind of opened like, oh, I, I can do that too, or I would like to do that too, or I would, would like to more, learn more. So I think as organizations within this industry, we can do the work also of educating about the work, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, so my next question um, is, you know, as we are seeing uh, a need for more innovative measures, more innovative solutions to address our climate goals or, or energy savings goals, um, we'll need new technology and how can we how can we ensure that the workforce is ready for these new solutions, you know, as baselines change? Uh, Nancy, um, oh, I'm sorry, one thing I'd like to emphasize is, you know, one thing that we're seeing specifically is just a, a, a renewed push uh, with heat pump. Uh, the DOE has, you know, been really driving home the, the point that we need greater adoption, and then states like New York are really pushing uh, heat pump adoption in their programs. And so, how can we get um, the trades, the the HVAC technicians, and the customers themselves to um, become more comfortable with these new technologies, get them prepared? Um, so that we can meet these these goals that we have. And, and Nancy, I'd, I'd like to start with you on that question. Well, I can speak a little bit from BPI's perspective as things come down the pike. Um, we are beginning to offer more certificate type programs or certificates themselves. Um, we are always working on up, upgrading our certifications and adding new certifications where they're needed. 
that is driven by a lot of times the market. Um, I stated earlier when I was talking about BPI that when we work on these things, um, we do not sit in our offices and write it and then send it out to you to just implement. We actually have committees of people who work in the industry. And I kind of look at us as um, <laughs> the gatherers. We, we get we organize the meetings, we bring these people together, um, and then the standards are developed, the certifications come from those standards, the certificates respond to what the industry is calling out. So, you know, right now, even since the time I came to be, we have uh, building science principles, we've added healthy housing principles, we've added a site supervisor, and um, we are working on a few others that I, I can't really talk about now because the I's need to be dotted and the T's need to be crossed. Um, but I just want you to know that we are keenly aware of that and doing our best to help. Um, we have a network of test centers across the country that actually offer our certification testing. Most of those organizations will offer training. So it's kind of giving them the guidance for what is the industry calling for, what is needed, and how can they implement that. So hopefully that answers at least part of your question. We, we are not on the side of developing the technology itself, but more um, making sure that the credentials are there and the skill sets come with that. Yeah, definitely. So what I what I heard is that, you know, the market will tell us what we need and then we'll will uh, respond to it. Um, Wells, would you like to uh, add to to what Nancy has just shared with us? Yeah, sure. I'll just add a little bit. You know, I think I think um, there's a really strong role that regulatory processes can play in this adoption process, and that is a bit of a top-down effect, um, which I think is you know critical uh, in terms of hitting um, and achieving climate action plans and goals. And then from the end user side, I think it needs to be sort of understood that like. A new a new hot water heater is not like the upgrading of like a television because you want something bigger or newer. And those are going to be unless you are in a, a point where you are, you know, comfortable enough financially to be like, I'm going to do whatever I can to make to make a conscious decision to become environmentally friendly in all facets of my life. These are things that are going to be that are going to be happening as devices retire. And so with the regulatory aspect, the end user is going to be swept up in that process. Um, and they are going to be, you know, pivoted uh, into whatever it is that's being, you know, mandated or pushed. And so from the end user standpoint, it's not so much about getting them to understand and adapt that technology. It's more about ensuring that there's a, a, a smooth transition from whatever their, their current, um, you know, system is to whatever it is that they're upgrading to. Um, and, and, and so the regulatory processes need to think about that, you know, specifically I'll, I'll, I'll hit, hit it from like the low income lens, you know, if we are going to be doing all of these, you know, um, hot water heater pumps and doing them in, in, you know, uh, mandating it across, uh, all facets of residences, you know, what's the incentive for a multifamily unit dwelling owner to, to upgrade that system, um, and, and ensure that it is not going to negatively impact the wallet and further displace and, and increase rent processes through that for low-income populations. How can you support the, 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 the end user to ensure that this transition doesn't have an adverse effect on them? Um, because the, if, if we make those strides, the labor will pivot um, as the technology sunsets. Nancy's certification processes are fantastic, and then eventually the market will pivot. And so then it becomes a mitigation across um, uh, uh, populations to ensure that that pivot is not adversely affecting certain populations and further marginalizing them or displacing them. Yeah, and I think one thing in particular, um, Nicole, is thinking about how we can leverage, and I, I think you sort of alluded to this in your intro, how we can leverage the existing workforce that's out there to shift a little bit to newer and different technologies. You know, I think what Wells said is completely true about the role that um, regulatory bodies or even individual utilities have to play in that. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience, the worst thing you can do to, um, to drive market transformation is to have programs that start and stop and start and stop with no continuity, because that doesn't give the trades any 
confidence in making investments or shifting directions. But I think, Nicole, the one that I personally hear about the most is in programs, you know, in, let's say, in electric programs where we're trying to promote heat pumps and having, you know, hearing directly from customers that, you know, my contractor told me they didn't want to install a heat pump. You know, and I think it's for, for a variety of reasons. I think it's still, you know, in many cases, in many geographies, still in an early adoption stage. I don't think, you know, they've committed in all cases to getting the right training or the right certifications, you know, from different organizations to get there. Not really being aware of, you know, sort of the global, you know, impacts. And, and that's really where I think we come in, in that trade ally management and trade ally development, making sure that trades have full awareness of utility programs, federal programs, understand the direction the industry is going so that we can help them keep up and maybe even lead the industry as opposed to getting left behind. And so it's certainly an iterative process. There's not really a single answer, but I do think it comes from working hand in hand with the trade allies to, to really keep the ball moving forward and making sure that you know all their questions get answered, all of their concerns get abated, and that way they're comfortable moving forward with the technology that you know the state or the utilities is trying to promote everyone's always always fearful of new things so we need to help get over that uh, over that uh, over that hurdle yeah so that's a perfect transition for my next question we are largely ratepayer funded um and so to train and de develop the workforce that we need um, we're going to need multiple funding sources because it's very difficult for utilities to to fund the, the entire workforce that we'll need and keep their, their programs cost effective. So, uh, for example, the Infrastructure and Investment um, Act of 2021, you know, uh, slated $40 million, um, I think, over the next two or three years. Um, to fund workforce development specifically. So can we talk about other non-traditional um, funding sources for workforce development that you know, we can use to layer braid um, that you as organizations might have used to supplement uh, your budget? Um, and Wells, uh, would you mind uh, starting? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Right now, there are large pots of money that are out there that are going to tackle workforce. You know, it's it's an issue that is um, especially you know green and clean economy jobs. There's a ton of money out there and a ton of interest, not just at the governmental level, but also at individual philanthropic and, and foundational levels um, that are really interested in finding ways to empower current workers and the next generation of workers to be part of the solution um, when, when talking about large climate impacts um, and, and, and then climate resilience and mitigation projects that are going to need to happen. Um, so you, you have those federal dollars. You then also have, you know, individual workforce development boards at the county and, and city levels that are really invested in this. Um, and if you can find ways to layer all of those different philanthropic ratepayer dollars, uh, city and federal and state dollars, you actually can tap into a very large pool. And it's all about finding what is that common thread across all of it um, in order to in order to bring it together and satisfy all the different funders. And really it's it's how do we get how do we start employing this next generation? How do we how do we start doing the work that we've been talking about for 20 plus years and we're now like alarm bells are going off behind us. How are we going to use these dollars to satisfy it? Um, but there's a lot out there um, and it's really, really encouraging from, from my perspective to see the amount of money coming out of the foundational and philanthropic uh, arms of, of the country and, 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 you know, pocketbooks and wallets. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's really encouraging to see that. Thank you. And uh, Harrison, you know, as implementers, is it difficult for us to, to to weave those fund in? Do we need to keep them separate? Like, how do we how do we manage that multiple funding sources that we know is, is necessary to address the gap? So is it difficult? Yes. <laughs> but but can it be done and should it be done? Yes. Yes. Also, you know, I mean, I, I think there, there are a few good examples out there about how we've been able to cross different, um, you know, different funding streams. I think a lot of uh, the low income programs we work in right now already do that, you know, with a combination of, 
utility dollars as well as a combination of federal dollars. We've managed to bring those two together in many states to, to run successful programs. We've also found that you know many of our utility clients actually have workforce development funding outside of the energy efficiency programs, but within their organizations that in many cases have been really successful in helping fund some of these programs that help drive the success of their own programs. So it's really using their own dollars to fund, to ultimately fund, you know, their 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 own programs. So I and I still think, and I think Wells hit on hit on this a little bit. You know, if we think about, you know, where we are now compared to, you know, 15 or 20 years ago when I got in the industry and first heard about BPI and got my first certification and think about where we were from a weatherization and air sealing perspective, you know, and, and how far we've come just in that sense. And now we're talking about, you know, taking more advanced technologies and really achieving that level of market transformation that we achieved with insulation and air sealing over, over the years. You know, I think we know how to do it. It's been done before. We just need to continue tweaking and adapting, you know, what it is we're training and where and who it is doing the training and who's funding the training. But I think we all know what to do. It's a matter of piecing it all together. And while it's not going to be easy, it's certainly the necessary thing to do. Well, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for participating in this. We'd like to take questions from the audience if there are any now. Um, and Emily, uh, I don't know if you are going to help us uh, read those questions or... Yes, I can read the questions. So there are a couple that have come through. Um, there is one that says, when performing community projects, are you simultaneously providing job training or hiring information to be shared with those you are serving in underserved communities? Would anyone like to take that? Well, I can add one thing. I know for BPI, we don't actually do training. We work with the programs, but we provide a place on our website for people uh, to list their resumes, people who hold certifications who want to work in our industry, for companies, organizations, utilities to review those, for um, organizations to post available jobs. Um, what what do you have up and coming? So our certified professionals know they can go to the website and search that um, job page. Um, we do, in some ways, need to do a better job of keep reminding people that that's available. Um, there are different different things, and I think there are other organizations that also do the same. Wells, would you like to add to that, or should we move? Sure, I can add really quickly. Rising Sun's not really implementing community-based trainings. We are implementing training programs for members of the community to to, to partake in, um, and and we do provide uh, you know for the adult program upon completion of the of their of their program, they have a year's worth of wraparound services. One of which is is job placement um, and and support. Uh, for our youth program, we are teeing up additional work opportunities after the pro after the the summer program wraps, so they continue to get further exposure. And then we have job uh, arcs that we love to see our participants follow that bring them back over a series of years and have upward progression and mobility. And then we also have many folks reaching out to us for job opportunities that we then pass through our, our alumni network and, and try to you know uh, uh, tackle that that those job openings with our staff. Yeah, and Nicole, I would say from Clear Results perspective, you know we're going a slightly different path. When when we win work or get get awarded work in specific communities or in specific areas, we always look to hire locally, right? Because we want folks who represent that community. So during that process, and as we do outreach to, you know, find find individuals, we end up as part of their onboarding, providing quite a bit of training. So as Nancy referenced, if it's a program that requires BPI certified staff, then we will take those members of the community who we've identified as having high potential, and we will train them to get them the right technical skills so that they can turn around and go serve that community and provide provide quality services to them. Thank you. Are there other questions, Emily? Yes, um, I'll go ahead and ask another one. Someone asked, are there any good examples of organizations or programs that establish, 
Sorry, I just lost the question. I'll start over. Are there any good examples of organizations or programs that establish or demonstrate best practices in braiding or stacking funding from multiple sources? Harrison, would you like to take that one? Uh, ab absolutely. You know, as we talked about a little bit earlier, it certainly is challenging. You know, it is being done in many states, um, you know, for the low income programs. I think the other area where we are starting to see a little bit more traction, I think Nancy referenced their, um, their Healthy Homes Evaluator certification. You know, we do have staff that are doing healthy homes visits and we are finding interest from healthcare organizations in being involved, whereas their, their focus is not as much on the energy as it is on the health and comfort outcomes. But I think there's some great opportunities coming based upon, you know, the, these, these additional perceived values. So while I think it's challenging now, I do think we're going to be able to break down more of those barriers. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but as, as things get more urgent, we're, going to, we're hoping to find people more flexible and more willing to, to, to start to braid those funds and to share, you know, and share the benefits of all this work. And, and I would add a couple, um, and, th and there are so many, I feel bad only mentioning two, but I feel like you can go and look these uh, look for the Delaware Help Initiative that's going on right now. Um, it's encompassing a lot of different organizations, and I use the term organizations kind of loosely, um, working together and providing all kinds of services like Wells mentioned. And the other one that's a really good one to look at is the uh, Green Step program in Connecticut, where they are actually implementing a program that goes all four years through the high school process. Um, uh, the students getting into the program commit to being there for the full four years of their high school career. They spend part of their day doing the academics and they spend part of their day working in different trades. Um, by the end of their high school career, they have um, typically done the building science principles to become familiar with that lease building science and house as a system. And then they can focus on a specific trade of their choice, depending on what's available, and come out with a credential that makes them employable right out of high school. And that is funded, I believe, obviously the school district is involved, but there are businesses and there are other funds um, and a lot of different organizations that work together to, to get this off the ground. And they've had some ups and downs in terms of, you know, funding was great initially and then there were issues um, with getting funding and, and now it's being implemented again. So, um, Funding is, is a big piece of what can or can't happen. And, and I would just add, I think the most uh, traditional or the most common one that we've seen is, uh, you know, working with the funds from uh, state energy offices to supplement uh, utility programs. Thank you. I'll move on to the next question. How do we go even further to reduce the barriers and increase cash resources for those who want to take a training course and find work from that program for those who have felony conviction on their record? I think that one's for Wells. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, we just need to invest in it and we need to ensure that these trainings are um, when possible at no cost to the participant and even have living stipends attached to them. Um, you know, the, the investment that is required from that individual is quite often so large that it can get in the way of a regular, um, you know, day to day, -to -day job or, or, or however it is that they're funding um, their life in the moment. And, and, and we need to recognize that burden, um, especially if they are previously incarcerated. Uh, you know, they are very much in need of, of, of financial services. Um, so make those trainings and those programs at no cost to them and when possible, pay them for their time to be there. And don't just have it 
end at the moment of certification. It needs to continue. Um, the the amount of barriers that are faced by folks um, that were previously incarcerated are are absolutely mind boggling. Um, things that we don't even think of as as a barrier, you know, like the reestablishment of a state issued ID or, or driver's license, um, and the the navigation that's required uh, to go through the DMV and how to start that process. You know, for someone um, who is incarcerated for 25 years, that's a very daunting and hard task. And so, realizing these wraparound services are just as important as the actual certification um, and, and education that they're going to receive and invest in them, um, you know, wholly. Uh, and, and recognize um, the 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 return on on investment that is going to come when this when this person is employed and now all of a sudden they can go out into the community uh, and, and and provide a, a positive service um, and, and and you know start investing back into into their roots. Thank you, Wells. Um, Nicole, I think that's about all the time we have for questions. If we did not get to your question. We will get back with you. Yeah. So thank you so much. I guess I'll just wrap up by asking each of the panelists what, you know, if they have any final thoughts that they'd like us to take away from today. And um, let's start with Nancy and then Wells and then Harrison. It's funny. I actually jotted three things down. <laughs> and now I have to look. Um, like I think our, our biggest challenge we've, we've talked about is getting people trained into the industry and as mentioned before, actually making the connection where they land in jobs with living wages. Um, and I think we can do that. I, you know, we have an industry that does pay living wages. So it's getting the pieces connected as we've discussed throughout this whole um, process presentation. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Um, I think one of the biggest opportunities that I could sort of put a plug out for is to recognize, you know, and this is coming from my, my youth development and, and um, uh, perspective, is recognizing the talent that a young person has but doesn't know how to showcase it yet. They're incredibly fast learners. They're engaged, they're malleable, and they just haven't had the opportunities. And so when looking at what requirements are there for entry level or, 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 or starter positions? What is truly required there? What can be learned on the job? And how do you bring young folks into the fold in a positive way that's gonna help them to realize their capabilities and then see upward progression and mobility based off of that first moment? Um, so yeah, I think that's the biggest opportunity that I can really push for. Yeah, and Nicole, I'll just I'll just reiterate something I think we all touched on, you know, at various points during this. You know, there there is no single silver bullet, right? It's going to be a holistic, industry-wide, nationwide approach to shift the way potential candidates, you know, regardless of how young or, or or how old they are, but to shift the way that they see the industry, perceive the opportunities, perceive the potential for career growth and advancement. And we've got to really make that shift at at, at every every level possible to achieve full fledged market transformation. And I think you know Wells, Nancy, you know, along with many other organizations, are doing a great job in, in, in moving the needle forward. Uh, well, thank you all so much for this conversation today. It was great. Uh, we have some information that on the slide that you can find out more about, or just reach out to Clear Result, and we will ha be happy to follow up. So thank you again, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Great day. Bye, Take care. Thank you.